Thanks for downloading this episode of the BIMTube podcast. Just a reminder that you can access all the podcasts in video and audio if you visit bim.tube. So our website again is at bim.tube. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the BIM Tube podcast. So today I've got Dan Rossiter. So firstly, thank you and welcome, Dan. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, so, of course, I know you very well, and uh, we often have chats. So t today, for the purposes of people who have not seen a podcast before, BIM, just to confuse everybody, in my context means better information management. We both know it means many other things, which we'll maybe get to. But just to begin with, Dan, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, and uh, I think critically for people that are new to this, these topics that we're going to talk about, your career path as well, if you don't mind. So over to you, Dan, please. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, you could probably tell podcast listeners I have a Welsh twang. Um, so I think we'll all start there. So um, I'm I'm Dan Rossiter. Uh, I currently work for the British Standards Institution. Um, I, I only say currently because of the career path, not that there's any planned transitions or anything. Um, well, this has started well already. Um, and the idea is that, you know, I first got trained up in architectural practices. Um, so I am a chartered architectural technologist. I'm currently their vice president technical, but at the time did an accredited course, spent a number of years doing school work, um, do it like refurbishing old libraries, heritage buildings, that sort of thing. And it was around that time I was introduced to this, this novel idea of, of this BIM thing. Um, and as the only person in the office who could read British standards and not fall asleep, I was given the task of, of looking at these standards and look at the impact on our things like, like our school program and those other bits and pieces, uh, which got me interested in the topic. Um, at the time, I was, um, I think I was inspired at this, this idea of the, of the building scientist, if I wanted to call it that, and knew some people who worked at the BRE. And I thought, well, that sounds cool. You know, hard hats and lab coats, you know. And eventually, they actually had an opening for someone with BIM expertise. So I went went over, managed to successfully get a role there. I spent a number of years then writing training courses and auditing companies for their certification scheme. And it was really great because it, it was full circle because I could sit there, audit a company on something, and then at a training course say, you know, this is how it should be done. And then some smart ass would put their hand up and go, yeah, but that's, that's not how it works in the real world. I can sit there and say, well, actually, two weeks ago, I was in a small 20-man structural engineering firm who did exactly that. Um, and obviously helped then inf inform it and move it all around. Um, and eventually then I was asked whether I'd consider coming over to British Standards to sit on, on the standard side. So what my role effectively is, is the node between British Standards and the wider industry, where I try to understand the problems and grumbles and how British Standards can help, as well as then be there node into the built environment when they're talking about how do we make standards smarter the use cases for people to do other things i can say well this will work for us or this won't and and have that kind of relationship there great Th thanks dan and um i like how you describe yourself as a node this is good not to, to, careful how we say this but I, I i think that bridging bridging the gap you know but like you're saying between different domains disciplines and the language that is a <clears throat> a critical path i mean that, that that's something I'm familiar with as well. And I, I guess the whole point of this podcast to some degree. So there's so much we could talk about. We've only got an hour, but I'll just hit you with a with a, a structured question uh, <laughs> to begin with, at least, which is one of the what is the sort of the most common challenges you face, like obstacles you encounter when you're developing and implementing standards. So again, obviously, that our take on this today is going to be about, with regard to the built environment and uh, engineering. But what are some of the key challenges to so either making the standard or implementing them? So I know it's a very broad question, but um, where do we start? And to be honest, I think the hardest bit is the implementing um, for it. And I think getting, getting a standard written to be honest, it's relatively straightforward. I've you know I've sat on a number of the formal ones, you know, our, our British standards, European international standards, and you know, there can be quite really interesting technical discussions on that. But by the time you've got a topic, you've got a theme and you've set off, 
it can't get written. Um, and as well as I've been involved with a number of our sponsored standards, you know, things like uh, Pazis and Flexes. I've even been a co-author of, of one of those, which is uh, Flex 1965, which is all about how to put BIM into specification documents, which, which was, you know, is quite an interesting one itself. The, the hardest bit is, is trying to get the buy-in and getting the adoption, because there are a number of, of steps in there, which, which are the problems. Uh, the first is discovery, which is the biggest problem of all. Um, I recently did a big kind of spiel where I went to talk to different architectural practices. I can sit there and go, right, out of interest, do you know about these construction procurement standards? No, I'm in Scoopies. I said, okay, fine. Do you know about this uh, international standard for how you should do title blocks and document headers for your document management? No, never heard of it. What about this one for line weights? And they say, oh, no, I haven't heard of that. I go, oh, I'm interested. And they say, well, oh, oh, what line weights are in there? And then I list them all. They say, oh, those are the ones on my pens. I say, well, well yes, because that's the international standard for it. Um, and then you go to the list and they say, never heard of it, never heard of it, never heard of it. And I say, well, what about 1950 and BIM stuff? They are, oh, I've heard of that one. Um, so there's there's a big discovery problem is there are, there are some really good standards. And people come to me and they say, oh, Dan, I've got a real problem. You know, there is no formal standardized way of doing this. I said, oh, you mean... EN 82045 part two, which is the European standard for metadata for document management. And they go, oh well, yeah, that's what I need. I said, well, I've, have you looked? Uh, and you know, it, discovery is that really hard bit because we don't make it easy. And you know, and you know, I will, I will say loads of things I'm sure I will regret on this podcast, but we as a publisher, as BSI, we are, we're terrible at that discoverability of our content. Uh, and I've had personal gripes with the way our website works and everything else. But you're trying to you, say you come to us and you say, well, I'm going to design a bridge. What standards do I need to design a bridge? We have no way of helping someone to discover that. Um, and, you know, but at the same time, you can sit there and say, well, there are different types of bridges. You need different standards, blah, blah. But discovery is a really big issue. Uh, the second part of it is then when people look at it, they immediately go into, right, I have a current way of working, which I think works well for me. And then I need to work out what is the investment, be it time, money, effort, culture that has to go into the change into the business. And now it, it can always be, it can be something that's really transformative and good, but still that change management aspect of trying to shift away from what you're doing is very difficult. And you, know, you and I have seen this with things like trying to adopt file naming conventions or doing these other things where people can sit there and go, well, actually, you know what? I've got my own, which I think works perfectly well, thank you, for the projects we work on. Why would I bother using this one? Um, and it always reminds me of when I ever did architectural work. I could sit there and make the most beautiful detail for windows. No one has any comment. Soon as they look at the carpet samples, they are suddenly an expert in interior design, and they all have a very strong opinion on the carpet. And when they've gone through the effort of creating their own standard for something, there's, there's some ownership there. They don't have ownership in this British standard because they might not have commented in the public comment stage. They might not have been involved in the earlier bits. So they sat there going, well, hang on. I built this thing that works better for me as opposed to this thing that works well for everyone. Um, and what they don't consider is, you know, even though it might work well for them, that client is going to be doing 50 projects with a bunch of different companies doing a bunch of things a different way. And it doesn't work well for that client to have everything named differently for every project. But it's it's trying to have that public good mentality with some of this, because if they adopt that standard, there's, there's a public good element. And I remember having a good conversation with someone around uh, upskilling staff. And actually, if we taught in the universities, that line weight standard, that title block standard and those things, could you half the upskilling time of new starters? Because instead of giving them all, this is my company symbols for drawings, it's the symbols in BS8541 part two, which is standard architectural engineering symbols, you know, then there's not so much to learn because it isn't this consultancy's way, it's the British way. Um, and I think it's, so really it's discovery and it's that mindset that are the hardest things probably to, to solve. And, you know, and and personally for me, the hardest of the two weirdly is discovery. Yeah, it's, thank, thanks for that. I, I, I was just thinking the, when you began talking there about the, the so the standards are hidden in plain sight if they're successful like people don't know i mean as as you know and probably 
people might not know listening or watching this, the um, ISO 19650, the BIM standards, which you mentioned, or information management standards. Again, I'll teach them and people <laughs> will say, oh, I've not heard of them. And they are using the file naming or the, the cont information container, careful what I say, convention. And I, I think I think that's it. And I think the challenge, have you got any observation around storytelling? It might seem I'm changing the topic here, but I'm not really because the, the, there, are, there are means to an end, aren't they, standards? I mean, they're an enabler, which you were talking about. They're an enabler for improving business processes and sta and literally standardization by definition but do you think there's a, a lack of and i'm abstracting away from the bsi just generally a lack of case studies or storytelling about why they're important do you think sometimes perhaps i think it'll it'll depend on the nature of the standard and what it's trying to standardize sometimes uh, and some of them have got great stories and even um like scary fun stories and you know a great one I, and i'll circle back around to your question but a great one is USB-C. so obviously you know, most people now have got some sort of phone and what they'll probably do is they'll have an apple phone which has the lightning port wherever it is you can tell i don't use apple stuff or you've got any other phone which probably has a USB-C charge point on it and you know not not that long ago the european union uh, as far as i'm aware put out a statutory instrument saying that new tech devices shall you have usb-c on it and one of the reasons that they could do that was because there is a international standard uh from the iec uh the number is 62680-1-3 for anyone who wants to do some light reading afterwards um but you know the point is that there's a standard for that charge thing and now there's a statutory instrument that says you need to have it on your devices and what's fantastic for me and it's a story i give when i talk about standards is that my my laptop my phone my nintendo switch uh, a number of my smart home devices all use a usb charger on it and and if if i ignore some of the you know the voltage and amperages and stuff and i'm a very bad person and plug my laptop charger into my phone when i'm desperate you know it does some very fast charging. It gets a bit warm, maybe, but you know the point is that there's a more universality that's being created as part of that. And and you're right in that when standards work super well, they don't exist. And you know there there'll be some really interesting ones for say uh, maybe some keyboard stuff. And I think there was a there was an anecdote somewhere that there's been like four thousand standards to go into creating a laptop. Uh, and of course, to use a laptop, you don't have to read any of those. Um, and I think it's trying to get to the point where it's not that people have to read them, it's that someone has read them to create a tool or a process that someone can use that is standards enabled. And you know, my, my when I talk to educationalists, I, I often play the idea of secret BIM. And I say, well, what you want to do is, why don't you make every submission for that university degree they have to follow the file naming convention. You don't tell them it's the it's the you know 19650 file naming convention. You say, I need you to name it in this way, and you get two percent of your mark is the correct name in the same way that you get five percent for good referencing and, and that sort of thing. And if you did that, if they spend three years learning, I need to look at this document over here on how it needs to be formatted and structured, which and which is all we really want people to do. Um, and I think that sometimes we do lose the the why sometimes for them but i think it does depend on what the standard is i mean some of them are fairly self-evident uh, and some of them do have great stories to them you know like the usb story like things like iso 9001 you know it's scary the amount of money implementing like iso 19 uh, 9001 actually has on businesses and some of the case studies there but perhaps we don't do enough to shout about those but then again if people can't find the standards how are they going to find the case studies yeah it's 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 a good point about linking, and you mentioned nine, I said 9001, and of course I'll link to anything we we say so that people can look it up. I think certainly with the, the BIM training that I've done, I always come back to 9001 because it's a, a commonality. And this this might um, be a self-evident question, but let's should we just explore what we mean by BIM, just for the sake of the um, unfortunately titled podcast with the name BIM in it, and then I actually mean, so, <laughs> so just back to basics, and then we'll get on to more strategic stuff, I guess, towards the end, but can you define, you're the man to know, I, sort of ISO 19650, and what it is, and, and just briefly BIM, if you don't mind, because we've mentioned it a couple of times now, so maybe just give, give a quick overview for that for people that aren't aware. Uh, yeah, that's fine, and I'll I'll predicate it with 
uh, I convened the terminology committees at Sen and ISO, so I will I will be remiss if I don't use the the official ISO definition for this, which I helped argue for, um, and I'll give it, and then I'll explain what it means, um, which is the best way standards work. Uh, is that you know from building information modeling or BIM is the use of a shared digital representation of an asset to facilitate design operations to form a reliable basis for decision. And what that means in 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 that sort of way is that it, you're using a digital representation of something. Say you're building a school, you've got a digital version of that school, and you're using it to inform the decisions you're making. And the the interesting point in what it does say and what it doesn't say is that it doesn't say it has to be a three D representation. You know, it doesn't say it has to be a building, and it you know it's trying to and it's all it's talking about is informing decisions. So if you have a two-dimensional CAD drawing that has accurate kind of spatial areas to help inform how big your, ex your extension needs to be, you're doing BIM in that sense because you're using a digital representation to inform your decision making. You have a robust uh, schedule of doors and windows and you're trying to do a refurbishment project or you know, upgrade them from double to triple glazing, you know, that, that loosely that's BIM in that way. And all what we all we wanted to do is try and create a a process standard that outlines the tasks that need to be done to facilitate that decision making. Because in order for you to get that information, you need to be able to request it. And that's where, and I won't go through the whole standard in all its bits, but one of the key ones are this idea of information requirements, where you can say, I want this information. And the reason you're asking for it is because you need to use it down the line for something. And uh, a great one I talk about with my fellow architectural technologists as an example, when we have this sort of conversation is I say, look, you're, you're designing a room and you are gonna specify how wide a door is. I said, a very easy one, for you to be able to design that door properly, you need to know how many people are expected to be in that room. You know, because as the, as the occupation rates go bigger from a you know, approved document point of view, the clear width of the door has to be bigger to facilitate escape. So an information requirement of yours might be, tell me how many people are expected to be in that room. And what, what amazes people is that they they think when we talk about information requirement, it's the nerdy Kobe Excel geeky stuff. Like, you know, give me, um, you know, unique identifiers and, and date kinds in specific formats. And they don't realize that asking for the color of the kitchen or where the size of the window adds an information when it when it completely is and this is why i get frustrated where people talk about bim projects i say there's no such thing as a bim project you know there's a school project we are building a school but what makes a project a bim project because you've asked for stuff or because you've used a computer because i'm pretty sure you used a computer on your last job you just didn't have a big fancy 3d model that you chuck stuff into and it's it's trying to realize that it's a lot more normal than people think it is yeah, it's, it's a good pain, point that um, obviously digitalizing or whatever words we want to use using technology has been about for decades. I mean, you know, like you were saying about architectural. I mean, it, I think that's the, the challenge, isn't it? But um, uh, using the term BIM implies things and it might everyone might not mean the same thing. Hence why we need a standard, I guess. But um, just just. And this is probably a loaded question because I probably know where we're going to go with this one. But do you still see a disconnect between construction and sort of the operation and maintenance and asset management side? Because, you know, it's obviously been traditionally is more focused on the construction and the project side in this in this context. But as as you know, I'm originally more from the asset management side. I I think there is. But have you got any take on that? Is there a disconnect and how are we overcoming it? Are things moving in the right direction? I think the answer is yes, there is a disconnect. Um, but I think it's it's starting to go in the right direction. And uh, interestingly, um, even yesterday, uh, I hosted a half day uh, virtual workshop from BSI where we're collecting some feedback on uh, 19650 because it's almost five years since it's been out. And one of the points that were raised there was trying to get that better relationship with asset and facility management. And while while the standards are written for whole life cycle, I think what people feel sometimes is that it's not written in their language. And actually, Anne Kemp made a very good point is that you know it's less plain language, it's more their language, because there's already an entire industry set up 
around asset and facility management and it's not about creating new words for their things but if we can sit there and say well when we say this what we're really meaning is one of those and then you know, a facility manager there go ah okay fine if that means that 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 means one of these is one of those you know yes okay right now what you're doing makes sense to me instead of going right we need a, a seventh term which is unique and shows no bias to everything that then everyone has to learn which you know is you know, is the way that some, some of the approaches have gone and you know a great example is um i'm gonna pull one out now um something like the task information delivery plan you know for when i was in practice that was for us it was effectively a, a drawing issue sheet almost combined but but done before the job so you're using it for resourcing um and then other people would have you know uh, deliverable schedules or and you know there are loads of different names people would come up with for these so having a standardized name is great but if you didn't pick any of the others because you didn't want to show bias to you know the the Skanska name or the Atkins name or the Borough Happel name for these things then you know you end up with a brief, completely new term and people are having to catch up again from scratch and I think we we haven't yet done enough to show asset management and facility management professionals how it connects into their language and their processes um, and an interesting chat i had to someone not too long ago was they don't um a, it was a, a facility manager person who doesn't like the project number on file naming convention systems and he said it's useless for me because the project's done and finished why do i need to know the project number and i'm sat there going well my personal view was that it, it's from an etymology point because if there's a problem with what happened there you're able to go back, work out who did the project, who the actual designers and teams and stuff. You know, it has a traceability element to it. So I don't know if that's an education problem on the facility manager or it's an education problem on me who thinks that's useful when in reality it isn't. And you know, I think th and I think we're getting closer to these um, because more people from you know from from your past life and others are getting more engaged in those standards to put those views in but you know we we try consensus and consensus evolves which is why standards get relooked at and get revised so hopefully we'll get closer and we're seeing more and more uh fm and you know, am software is being able to pull in things like kobe which uh you know for those listening who might not be too sure kobe is effectively a, a standardized format for expressing you know, handover information typically in an excel spreadsheet format but can be done in other ways but you know you're now seeing that they, those sort of software has have import functions to bring that information in so we're, we're getting closer but i think that it's it's not there yet yeah and and, and i think i think the that point you make about the different terminologies is interesting because that to some extent that will always be the case won't it you'll get all, all domains can never uh, industries sectors uh, even directorates in the same company or organization can never well will never have exactly the same language so i think this glossary uh, i mean we ha we haven't sort of rehearsed this but just a, a question out of interest for me this sort of lookup table or this glossary of terminologies right you call it this i call yeah. it that it is arguably how i got into all this stuff in the first place it's not easy but is what what's going on in that area i mean either bsi or, or other other i know you touched on it but is that something that's been focused on am i missing something like an actual translation layer um yeah i think some of it's in, in in an ideation form and i remember that speaking to people like ann kemp and the guys at nema one of the things they were looking at for their guidance was could you say a certain persona you know i'm a architectural professional i'm an engineer i'm an asset manager and actually could they be at a point where that lookup table swaps words out uh, but I, I i don't think they have the tool to do it i think the idea is that is this something that people would find valuable and then they could explore it but but i'm in two minds for it because while accurate terminology is great also the real world doesn't work like that and my, my favorite example is you know i have this white thing on the wall behind me um which makes the room warm now what would you call that yeah so i'd, I'd call it a uh, a heat exchange no no radiator you see that's it yeah, right? you, you call yeah. it a radiator all right now tell me does a radiator radiate no it convex doesn't it yeah. yes yeah so so there's there's a really there's often this kind of dichotomy between what what the right word for it is 
and what what people use and i think that's the one we we will struggle against in that way of you know if someone calls you know if i call that a space heater people will know a space heater is probably one of those electric things that you buy and you know it's not it's not that that's a, that's a radiator why would you call it something else but then it's it's not the right word for it and we have these similar sort of things that you know, you know, people can sit there and go, well, actually, we don't particularly like this idea of a common data environment. You know, it has the word data in it, and we're all about information exchange. And you say, well, you're too late now. That's the word everyone uses. Um, and I think that's that's the struggle that's going to be, is when you look at things and go, well, actually, you're using the wrong word. We're also using the wrong word for it. And how do we try to connect those together? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point. I mean, I won't labor this point too much because, of course, this is the, the stuff I love. The, this, you know, and you get one to many, many to one. You know, at least you're talking about the radiator and we could look at a picture and then you've got other languages. You know, we're not even getting into that. But I still think there's something about form and function because you were saying, oh, but like implying the function of uh, it, you I, know, I, form. I think, and then yeah. the name might be heater F3. Do, so I, yeah, yeah. So we're, we'll start to go down a rabbit hole of, and we, we, we won't take too long on it. Um, I, I've been in many conversations about things, and I don't mind putting my 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 colours on the wall for this. I dislike UniClass, um, the UK's national classification system, um, and I much prefer uh, the work that's been done for things like CoClass, which is this, this sort of more European classification system, and it's for the reason you're talking about. So. In UniClass, uh, you can look up a bunch of stuff and you get uh, terms for it. And so, for example, you'll find metal door. And you go, okay, cool. That's going to be a door made out of metal. You'll find a composite door. And you go, okay, that's a door made out of multiple things. But I'm sat there and I kind of go, well, hang on. At what point, how many things or what percentages stops it being a metal door and turns it into a composite door? No information is available. Um, you look at wood screws. And I sit there and I go, are those screws made of wood or are they screws for wood? And I'm pretty sure that they're, they're screws for wood. Um, but you also find things like pedestrian paving. And I hope that that is pavement, uh, paving for pedestrians. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure what practices MBS and others are up to. But, you know, you it's, it's tongue in cheek in a way, but you also find things like large mirror. I sit there and go, well, large to whom um whereas when you look at some of the co-class stuff they start with a definition and then they have synonyms that apply to that definition and what will happen is is that it's, it's not a door it's an object that allows the movement of a person between two spaces or something like that is and i'm i'm pulling it from my memory which is why it's a bit clunky and then they'll have things that apply to that door gate you know um uh, like hatch and those sorts of things and then the point then is is that you if it fits the the concept then it have all these synonyms and actually i very much like that idea of of how we do things which is how we try and do a lot of the terms and definition work the problem is that we don't have probably the right admitted terms you know these alternative ideas of what it can also be called which are those sector specific instances of things where you know a design and issue register could be an admitted term for a task information delivery plan. You know, a project execution plan could be part admitted for the BIM execution plan if you decide to put those bits in there or something like you know. I think there's a, and it might be um as you said before, like a, a one to many or a many to one or a many to some in a way of it does two thirds of it, um, but doesn't do all of it scenario. Um, because you know I've seen some really well written, uh, you know, employers requirements which are kind of functional briefs that have information requirements buried in them. And I'd say, well, it functions as an EIR, but only clauses you know, seven, eight, and nine, where the rest of it is saying, I need this U value for this window, or I need these spaces to facilitate X amount of children running and screaming at, for PE lessons. And I think it's moving to definition and scoping for terms, I think it's, it's a much healthier way of looking at things because also in the future, someone invents a new product, which is, you know, uh, uh, almost like a, like a stable door, but works vertically instead of horizontally. I don't know, I, it, it's, it's farcical, but for your super skinny people, they don't want to open the whole door. They can walk through it and they have, you know, we want to be able to say, well, that fits in that bucket instead of having to make a brand new word and then trying to work out how it fits into everything else. 
Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I mean, I, I again, I'll have to move off this topic because we, I I could go down a complete rabbit hole on this, but but it's I find that most fascinating because it's definitely based on people's background, isn't it? The sort of scientist in me then wants the detail, and uh, engine engineers typically will have go for what you're talking about, like a definition. You said a large mirror. Even I would say, well, what are the dimensions? You know, so again, you've got survey, you know, my background is in GIS and things. So you, you'd be talking about dimensionality of it, whereas other people <laughs> almost unbelievably won't, which is which is in, 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 anyway. So I think that that layer, I mean, um, and also consistency. I think one thing I was going to mention is uh, which probably won't add value to the conversation, there, but just to throw in there as a an interesting uh, standard is ISO 8601, which is the international standard for date, the date yeah. convention. So, because I know we've gone quite detailed, but just bringing it back up, even how people write a date, and it's not necessarily to do with the American European style thing, people can't get that consistent. I think that that's, I often start with that. Do you know what I mean? There's no complexity there. Can we agree how we write the date? <laughs> yeah, yes and or no, you know? Well, exactly. You know, and that, that standard is a great example because it has a, almost a secret use case people don't know about, which is that if you follow the date convention in 8601, is that when you do folders with those dates, the folders end up in chronological order because you've gone year, month, day, and which then means all, you know, all your most recent stuff is at top, which is super useful um in that sort of way that for you to find things whereas obviously if you go month day year or day month year or whatever you've ended up with all the first of january stuff all, all lumped together in that way which you know isn't particularly helpful and you know it's it's a standard that has a really interesting use case for that reason but you know and i i went through a phase more because i work for british standards of actually trying to write my dates when i manually filled in forms doing year month day but you know solicitors looked at me very funny when i was buying my house and i was putting date conventions in in a way they weren't used to um and you know not to, not to rock, rock the boat i think i transitioned back to normal uk date formats um but you know it's just an example of how something that's obvious and really everyone should do hasn't permeated you know everyday life and and not to start to be you know making this too too controversial you know it was it was only a couple of months back you know the government was looking at bringing imperial units back in and you know it was it was quite scary to see talk from you know Jacob Rees Mogg and others about this idea of you know bringing back you know units that we haven't used for quite a while um as a as a, as a UK quirk effectively um where you know if you if you're in such things you'd know that an inch is actually defined by how many millimeters it is uh, so it's technically is a um an si unit it's just got a, a funny conversion in the back end once again secret standards in that way um so but people are, are precious about the thing that they own they remember and they have ownership of like we talked about earlier yeah and i i, I think um I think it's a it's a good example with the, with the units because certainly with my background in rail we use all of the above. So uh, unbelievably in the London Underground we use meters. What I mean is unbelievably we've used it quite a long time, surprisingly for at least for track. And then on network rail you have all of all of the above again miles, chains, and yards. And uh, I, I had I saw one one day which was um, I won't say what data set it was, but it was miles and meters, and the meters were a decimal. So, my, so I thought I was going crazy. So they, it was written down as mile. Mile was the you know yeah. the whole number, and then the the decimal was was meters. I just absolutely bizarre mixing things. But anyway, uh, so we better move off that topic. But I but I think it's things like that, like anecdotes, you know, actual real use cases where it becomes alive. I, I, I'll just because you mentioned it, so I'll just ask you for, again for the benefit of people listening and watching about what the, the flex standards are. Now you did mention it um maybe just an overview to them and what their purpose is so just a high level overview if you don't mind that'd be great no that's fine I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of, i'm not here to promote the virtues of, of bsi products so i'll do oh no but i've late. asked i really no but i really want to know it's about awareness right so yeah go for no, it that's fine so yeah so we in a, in trying to be more 
agile in the way that we can deliver things. Um, we originally created that kind of PaaS system, which were fast track standards. So typically you think of uh, a British standard, it can take really maybe three years to go from ideation to, to public publication, because um, it takes quite a while to convene the people, go through it and go over everything else. So the idea was that, you know, you could effectively sponsor a kind of sped up but still robust process that could then go through and create some sort of standards that meet more quicker needs um and i think at one point i think paz um 1192 part five i think is a great example of the security one where from memory it took i think six months to go from ideation to publication with that one um and so so the idea is it could be quicker now with the flexes they're trying to bring in more of a kind of agile methodology and the idea it has that kind of more scrum sprint sort of feel to it in that they have iterations so and the point is if you're in a very nascent topic and actually consensus isn't there you can't really publish something leave it for two years and say well that'll do because the landscape is changing so it's a it's a product that can allow for that kind of iterative development to happen after it being published you know and a great example could be something like um connected and autonomous vehicles it could be something like digital twins the built environment where a lot of thinking is being developed you could sit there and say right well this this core nubbin of it we're confident that we can make consensus on now and while we develop consensus in this other area we can then do iteration two which bolts that bit on and then maybe we can put a placeholder in for this bit um uh, for currently and then we can expand on it in iteration three and then the idea is you could every two three months actually publish iterations on it where you refine and extend and improve it in that kind of we quickly come together agree what it is go off write it throw it out come back together in that you know scrum sprint-esque sort of way yeah that's great thanks dan just for the overview because i think that's um that iterative cycle is where like like you were saying, I guess traditionally standards can't keep up. You know, it's like with with regulation or law. There's all again, obviously, get back to the I guess to the topic of the the podcast about right? information, digital data management. It's really hard for things to keep up, isn't it? Because each year or six months is something else, and it's almost impossible to keep up with things. Well, it is, and there's also the question of whether it should keep up, uh, because obviously, when you look at the kind of the the adoption curve and you've got you know your you you've got your laggards at the back early adopters at the front and then you've got the kind of the that kind of majority middle of people who after a while start to adopt you know who are you actually targeting the good practice at because you know and not saying we should but say you know in a gold, a gold bronze silver idea that standards are maybe set at, at silver you know, there needs to be a space for early uh, for the early adopters to innovate, improve, and say, you know, we're going beyond the standards. We're doing something even better and you know, in even more cleverer than than what's written there. But at the same time, you know, there are people who are sat doing their traditional process if they think that's fine and it's good enough. And while that landscape moves and evolves, do you want the standard to stay at stay at gold? In which case, then it's unachievable for for the vast majority who haven't yet got those technologies that skill and that culture or do you set it at more of that sort of silver level where it's good for the majority but you know it falls short of the capability of those early adopters or do you go for lowest common denominator and hit that kind of bronze level where it's even at the laggard level and you know that's that's where often we see where regulation and statutory instruments sit is they need to hit that bronze level because it's it what we need everyone to do it there's no point saying you know, the speed limit is five miles an hour because not everyone's going to drive at five miles an hour. And I think it's it's trying to work out where you get the most people captured in there. Now, interestingly, you know, we're having lots of stuff happening around the Building Safety Act and all those changes and regulatory reform. You know, a lot of our digital friends uh, are going to be disappointed probably with how digital some of the requirements are going to be for capturing information for high risk buildings and that's because they're going to want it to be api enabled and fully structured information against you know a formally agreed schema that allows for near real time you know and that that's what they want but you know how many higher risk building owners and managers are able to do that so is it you know and that's and that's the challenge with 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 standard sometimes and is you need to pick where and there's also that um 
almost i guess oxymoron aspect of it is if you change it too much people won't want to follow it because they want stability in the standards because they don't want to have to kind of reinvest and rechange the whole time so you also have to balance how when you trigger the change based on what's happening because if it changes too often people get fatigue and if it doesn't change often enough it then becomes out of touch and not useful anymore yeah it's i mean i, I don't envy you i, I mean I, I think about these things but not the, yeah it is a difficult balance isn't it it's um, especially when they're embedded in the wider governance it, uh, what i mean is like internal policies in an organization or a, a business because because that's Again, a lot of my data was saying, well, we need we need to embed the stand embed the standards involves, like I say, the governance of a of a company potentially. And then you've got allocated roles and you're quite right of you move the goalposts. Um how about maturity? I'm just uh, just as you were talking, I was just thinking you were saying about exceeding the standard. Now the the one of the standards that I'm most familiar with other than nineteen six fifty is um iso 55000 series which is for the benefit of other other people <laughs> asset management so strategic asset management um uh iso 55001 is the, the one you get certified against now now i think that uh, there is the institute of asset management and other organizations where they have this maturity and you can go beyond and this is this has been for some time but do you think we're missing that scale of maturity for other standards or maybe it's something bsi are involved with or maybe the industry body so in when you were talking you were saying oh people can just make the standard but obviously we need to allow others to exceed the standard my observation is maybe there's something missing there i don't know if you've got any comments on it to say to say this is the standard but guess what there's three more chapters to say this is the exceeding would would that work or is that is that undoing the whole purpose of a standard and i'm just getting overexcited i mean it's an interesting question and uh, i'll be honest my my ideas are forming as 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 you asked it and i think that it plays into how does innovation interplay with with standards and i often get told that you know standards hinder innovation. So these standards, you know, they stop me from in, from innovating. And then when I say, well, we'll explain how, I, I, I don't get very good answers off people because the reality is that a rubbish. Standards, in fact, quite often help with innovation. And the anecdote I often give is, you know, if some if some very rich person from Dubai comes to me and says, Dan, I want to do you to design me a thing. Here's all the money in the world. Here's all the space in the world. I want a thing. There, I will. There's no way I can come up with with a design for that. What you need are constraints to innovate around. Whereas, you know, if if the mayor of London rung me immediately after the guy from Dubai and said, "Look, I need a high school. I need it up right next to the the Thames. Unfortunately, you've only got a third of the size that a normal high school has, and we've only got four fifths of the budget for it." Immediately, you start to sit there and go, "Well, well, what are the ideas I can do to?" To fit a smaller school to do that and you know so i think what what the standards try to do is create the framework that things happen in but they are not overly prescriptive it might say that you know you need to do a thing but it might not necessarily say how that thing is done um so that people can innovate and go around it and this is also where a lot of the evolving good practice eventually then comes from because you take 19650 for an example um in europe they've written guidance documents around how to do it that also starts to point to other standards or starts to talk about more sophisticated uses of the common data environment and other aspects to it and then people then start to write offshoot standards that then talk about you know how you might do uh, interconnected common data environments we saw uh, standards around things like interconnected data dictionaries semantic modeling and these other things that are kind of blossomed out of these initial ideas and then eventually they can come come full circle and then now we're starting to look at revising iso 19650 all these ideas and the five years we've had of people using it we get feedback what doesn't work but also the novel practices that they've created or built uh, as a result of it uh, and one interesting one i have seen which you know don't know if i get in or not but it's a novel idea is all the information requirements in 19650 are top down it goes client down to tier one tier one to tier two tier two to tier three and the idea was actually if you are an architectural firm say working on the project there's information that you need so does there need to be a bottom-up set of information requirements uh which i think they were calling their task information requirements so you say well that's great but for me to do my service 
I need to know who's in those rooms, what the size of the space is. You know, I need this information from the project. And that's not in the standard. That's someone going beyond the standard. But in theory, it's something that we can subsume in the future to make the standard better. So I think setting the benchmark of this is what, and it, it goes back into our semantic terminology discussion. You'll notice if I speak about standards, I never use the phrase best practice. BSI might, but I personally never say best practice. I will always say good practice. And I say it really carefully for two reasons. One is that I think best is unambiguously, there's no other way of doing it than the best way, where I think good is, you know, it, it's a perfectly good way of doing it, but there may be alternatives or there may be room for improvement there which I think allows for that innovation, ideation, and that change. Because if it's best practice, then we can leave it on the shelf and we can forget about it. But good practice is well, actually how to make that good practice better. And I think setting it up good so that industry can play with it and then come back and say, well, actually, we've done better for three years. It looks like this. Well, so, okay, well, that better can now become good. And then in which case then you can go off then and find new betters and come back to us after if you want. And it helps then create that life of, of, you know, curated consensus around what good looks like because, you know, back to the file name and stuff, what's better for a company who only do work on hospitals might not be better for industry at large. And I think it's trying to make sure that what we have works. And the, the silly comment I give sometimes is, you know, a one size uh, all fits all t-shirt doesn't fit anyone well, but it fits everyone. And actually, are you trying to look good in that T-shirt or are you trying to keep warm? Because depending on what you're trying to do is how appropriate it is for that solution. That's that's a really good point. I I, I was going, which you've, you've answered or you've touched on <clears throat> about, and again, maybe you've just given me the language to talk to other people about it. I often say, well, everything's a compromise, right? Oh, yes. And I see everything as a Venn diagram, <clears throat> you know, overlapping and it's that sweet spot or whatever. Uh, you've articulated it in a better way there because the, oh, the word compromise is obviously negatively loaded but that's sort of the, the language that i would have used maybe i'll talk about t-shirts now because it's more because people get it but it but it is right there's always you could always throw more money at it particularly so ironically i don't talk much about technology on the on in detail on on this podcast but again that's the whole point with a in like both of us with sort of information systems backgrounds and i've got sort of a broader it background that you could we could always do better we could always do interoperability of systems you can throw money at it and we and i think that's the challenge we we know that we know you know we and i'll, I'll say that to client maybe we've got some uh something to say about this about trying to get people's heads in the right space um i'll say well if we had infinite budget like you've just said we could have all the technology in the world all the standards but ha have you seen uh sort of where marketing where i'm going with this is about we need good communications right so have, have you seen either organizations or clients uh, work with marketing professionals and communication professionals because this is what i think is missing um, you know, we, we talk about we need a good story. I, the first thing is people don't say, oh, let's go and get some communication and marketing people. Have you got anything to say about that? Have you either seen it or have you seen a lack of it? You know, I, I'll probably say I've seen, I've seen a lack of it. Um, and I think this is where uh, an organization very dear to my heart, uh, Constructing Excellence, I think, was, was always very good at and uh and and i think it's 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 a place they probably need to take more ownership in which is my very positive careful way of saying please please to more in this space um is that we they when i was growing up were almost like a case study champion place and where people would have those messages and do it was there and i remember you know being that small kind of I wouldn't say timid, I've never been timid, but that slightly timider boy in, in architectural practice, you know, reading about projects that had zero waste on site. You know, and there's a case study where they actually done segregation and they have done things like tweaked the dimensions of rooms to have less uh, off cuts of bricks and blocks. And, and I was I'd be like, wow, you know, that's, that's some incredibly fancy stuff. And I'm sat there going, well, can we try this in our project? You know, and which is the the goal of the case study is to make it sound interesting enough that you want to try it, and you know you can sit there and go right. Well, who is the 
who is the vanguard of of information management and stuff you go well that's someone like Nima. Well, okay well that's fine who's the vanguard of something like building safety and you might have like building safety alliance or someone so cool well who's who's our storyteller you know and i think exactly as you're saying it's very hard to work out who that storyteller is and people sit there and say well we need use cases and or so not use cases we need case studies and those case studies often end up being commercially driven and with the contracting excellence ones were always very balanced it was oh, we tried this it went wrong but these are the reasons why it went wrong and they can say well, well that's that's really useful not you know we are consultancy x and we managed to say x million pounds on this so we're brilliant and if you want to find out more use us on a project click here you know well you know all i've really done is read an advert um so i think it's been very careful about how we do it but i i would really value this idea of a of a neutral storyteller like constructing excellence and i i did have a conversation about a year or so ago with some government officials around building safety i suggested constructing excellence was the right place potentially for them to start collecting building safety stories and and to kind of pull those cases together of what good looks like in the short term because you know there's a lot of new fresh ground here around how you do good record keeping for high risk buildings and going through the gateway processes for the planning reform and all these other things and we we could do the stories of the frustrations people faced as well as the successes and i think it doesn't show weakness for a company it shows bravery they're willing to be exposed in that way of saying you know what we had a really tough time with this because we hadn't thought about x um but you know people are very risk averse and that risk appetite around transparency is is a big problem for it but i think in in, in finishing my ramblings and answering your question i don't think there's enough balanced marketing conversations with people and it's too focused on using it as a commercial opportunity instead of an altruistic public good messaging of how cool the built environment is and the projects we work on yeah th thank you and and actually surprisingly maybe when i when i asked that question I, I wasn't actually thinking of the commercially loaded but i mean that's that's obvious i mean it's um but somewhat people have an agenda let's put it that way whatever it is and and, and obviously you're quite right to say it's often com commercial i think um yeah anyway I'd, i better leave that there because i i was gonna sort of reflect on when when people maybe don't have the uh commercial agenda maybe the case studies are not great or but that was the whole point that we were making right so yeah. so yeah so maybe that's the skills gap but uh, i throw it in there because um i think i was at uh i can't remember london build anyway one of the conferences were at and we were i think on stage i won't say who was on stage but anyways one someone we know and it and it was it was all very good. It was about sustainability and it was about BIM and information management and governance. Now, what came up, it was a panel session. I wasn't on it, but one of the points that came up um for me was everything that was being talked about wasn't actual information management. So for example, the session was called information management, and then all of the skills gap elements that came up had nothing to do with information <laughs> management so again sorry not to reiterate the whole the topic we were just talking about but it, one of them was comms one of i can't remember now but they were like change so, so for example i will go with my thought here change management you've mentioned yeah. that already now surprisingly for some people that's a profession <laughs> you know so again have you have you got anything sorry just to maybe round that off uh, the conversation off uh, moving away from comms and marketing around change management and the other complementary disciplines again what 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 do we do about that how do we get change management professionals involved um so i don't know I, it's more a comment I, I don't know if you've got anything to comment on that because i always see it's process driven right there are process improvement professionals this is a career but and i i'd agree somewhat but it it brings back that old adage of uh people process technology in that way of the these things are multifaceted and you know we've seen great examples recently of people worried about chat gtp generative design sort of stuff job stealing aspects of it and so there's there's a people management element there of how do you make it an enabler of your role um where you might have um the, the suggestion is tech positive let's bring this tech in to, to be pro, uh, have productivity improvements process positive you know we spend less time and resources doing this but then it's people negative because people are sat there going you know well that's me out of the job 
where they will be instead, you know, through a change management professional or similar, they could actually about, well, actually, how do we make it so you're not having to sit there and do 50 iterations of this structural design because the computer can do it for you and you could focus on the more human aspects of your role like um problem solving you know and you know negotiation stuff and relationship management and those sorts of things and at that point it then becomes tech positive process positive and people positive and i think all too often people go in and think oh you know a drone with a hd camera or we could certainly use one of those bang bought it um and say oh barry you can look after this we'll give you a raise we'll make you our survey and drone expert people positive bang and then no one's actually thought about well actually what will we use it for um, and then it's process negative because they actually then work out that google earth has been perfectly fine for the last five ten years because all they needed was some aerial shots for context and they spent an awful lot of money on something that actually doesn't have any process improvements so i think it's it's that whole idea of organizational resilience and adaptability and that way of you know, you want to bring something into the business great how do you do it in a way that's actually a net positive for you so you don't sit there and go well we, i've just spent two grand on this uh piece of software and i have to spend two grand every year on it and if, if people are in the design author and they probably know what piece of software i'm on about in that sort of way and then they sit there and kind of go and it does nothing for me as well hang on like, have you actually thought about the processes it does for you automatically generating view schedules and everything else? That's process positive. You know, you've been upskilled and we know that very good people who use that software get stolen and pinched from other companies. So that's people positive in a way. And, you know, people make more money, work on more projects. And actually, so there's a tech positive there. But if they don't think of it in those three areas, it feels like it's it's a cost, not an investment. And I think there's... The same can all be said for all the standards. You know, you want to put change all your data formats in your business. So great. Well, look at it in those three three areas. Make sure it's people, process, tech, posit- and all that. And if it ticks all those boxes, do it. If it doesn't, don't buy and don't read my standard. Because to be honest, if it doesn't work for you, I don't want you to use it. Because these are standards in the end of voluntary tools of convenience. And unless it is a convenience, don't use it. Yeah, or unless they're mandated, or uh, so by law. I mean, which is an interesting conversation. Certainly, in other domains, the uh, ISO nineteen six fifty R. Sorry, go ahead. I would only say that surprisingly few are are mandated in law, and the the, the adage I often give is that people talk about the building regs. They say all your standards in the building regs. I say no. There, there's one standard cited in the building regs. All the others are cited in the non-obligatory guidance to the building regs. And I think this is the point quite often where you look at something like 19650, it's not, there's no law that cites it and makes it a requirement. The government on a comply or explain basis specified in their contracts. But through contract negotiation, you've got to turn around and say, we can do everything you want, but we can't do the BIM bit. And if they're the best bidders and you're working on a cost quality point, what are you going to do? You're probably going to say, well, we'll use you, but we'll have to then explain back to big government why there's no digital element on this project. Now, I can't imagine that scenario playing out in that way, but that's the reality of of the system and the structure. Um, so a lot of it is surprisingly voluntary, but it's there for, for convenience and public good. And I think that's the bit that people tend to forget sometimes. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dan. I've nearly had all my time with you, but j- just one uh, quick penultimate question, um, if I may. The um, I was just going to ask about just taking it up a notch, if you like, around things like sort of ESG. It's just a very quick answer: environmental uh, uh, sustainability and sort of governance, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Do these come up? So uh, it could just be a binary answer. Do these kind of higher level topics? Uh, come up often i mean that that's sort of always in the back of my mind when i talk about all of these topics about sort of an ultimate aim outcome benefit do do you talk about them with clients a lot or not really a fair bit like less so than than i used to to be honest uh but we as british standards one of the things that we've done is we signed something called the london declaration and i'm sure show notes or something can point to that in more detail but effectively the result is that whenever we write a a standard PAS, FLEX, or the more formal ones, we consider what are the UN Sustainable Development Goals that it supports. 
and that's done that's done for every single one of our standards um so this idea of what is the outcome that document helps achieve is core to what we do as a business um and you know that that document and and the bits around it that people can look at afterwards provide a lot more detail than i probably can here great thanks dan and and just very briefly so thanks so much for your time is where where would you so i will send a link to the the reference that you've just mentioned there but what other websites or resources would you point people to i know there's hundreds out there but maybe there's just a few that you'd recommend so it could either be about beam or information management or just standards generally that you think people would get something from uh so what i'll i'll choose to point to self selfishly if people were to just follow me on social media uh i tend to share when a lot of the relevant BIM data information management standards are either published or out for public comment. Uh, so if you want to have a say and say, oh, actually, I, I'd rather this change or do that, following me on Twitter or LinkedIn uh, allows you then to at least know when those things are happening. Um, and I and I just do that because I'm an awkward sod and I enjoy you know, posting these things out. Uh, the other, and I will find you the link for it, is that we do uh, monthly free webinars as well as a free virtual events and they all become on demand afterwards and it's a very rich resource of videos on a whole you know, raft of topics and we go into things like retrofit and the past 20 20 35 stuff we have a, a current collaboration with the institute of fire engineers where there's stuff there on things like the gateways and building safety reform and other bits and pieces there's lots on there on bim and information management i'm sure i've done one on some of the document management metadata and we typically have experts who come in supported by a, a bsi person who speaks to them um we did one quite recently on the roba plan of works where we had dale sinclair join us for example and i think that that list is a very powerful list for someone to look at and look at a topic that interests them and then listen to a free hours webinar on it that might point to some useful standards that might help them so i think rather than giving too many i'll say that list and following myself on social media are probably two great places to start Great. Thank you, Dan. And um, I think having that cross sector horizontal view as standards does is is um, something that's missing in a lot of people's uh, career, I think. So that'd be a great place to start. So thank you. I've had my time with you, but thanks so much for your time, your insights and sharing uh, your thoughts today with me. So thank you very much, Dan Roster. Thank you. That's right. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks for downloading this episode of the BIMTube podcast. Just a reminder that you can access all the podcasts in video and audio if you visit bim.tube. So our website again is at bim.tube.